I think most of you were here last week as well, if not everyone. Um, and I'm sure today uh, promises to be as exciting and enlightening as the <laughs> one uh, presentation was, of course. Um, I'm going to start today with a few words from our associate VP, Mike Fierro. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm happy to uh, bring the greetings of the building with my colleague Anthony here. Uh, Jack and Greg are both off campus, so here I am. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. So I think they've, uh, you know, I, I, I want to say that um, the college has made a great commitment, I think, to development, developmental education in general and, and to the English project in terms of reassigned time and in terms of support. Um, so I, you know, I personally want to thank them, I want to thank the college with a big seat uh, for, for really taking on this initiative and for you folks for really taking the leadership in terms of the English um, program. Some, some of you may, may know and some of you may not know that I spent about 20 years as a, an English teacher back in the day at, at Durfee High School, in my formative years, and uh, hope, hope to maybe go back and do some teaching in a, another year or two. So maybe I'll join you guys as an adjunct, who knows? Um, so I, I really do have a passion for, for uh, English and language and writing especially and so I'm going to hang in here for about an hour, I've got about 18 meetings today like usual but I'll stay for a little bit of it and catch some of it. Um, but I've always, I always say whenever I go anywhere that you know studies that I've read for, for a thousand years you know always speak about how uh, it doesn't matter what field you're in, the people who succeed are people who write well and speak well. Um, so that communication, you know, when we talk about workforce development, there's so much emphasis on, you know, the other side of the house, career things, and, and you guys really are uh, the heart and soul, I think, of any kind of workforce effort, because it really truly is that ability to communicate that will make our students succeed, that will make our, our community succeed. So I just want to thank you for doing that. Thank you for being involved in this level. I know it's not an easy job. I've, I've had those 100 papers sitting on my desk, so I feel your pain. Um, and I'm just excited to uh, to join you today. So, thank you, and I'll hang in the back for a little while. Anthony's going to wave now. <laughs> Have a good day. Is there going to be music in the background? That's cool. <laughs> yeah. I think they just played him off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the Academy Award. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, our second speaker today is Suzanne Patricia. Suzanne is nice going to talk to you me. a little bit about um, another grant that uh, we have at the college right now called Transformational Agenda. And that grant is actually um, helping to pay for what we're doing today. So, it's important that we learn a little bit about the Transformational Agenda um, in case and hopefully uh, people will want to become involved. So I want to um, echo the thanks to the folks who, Deb and um, JP, for today, putting together today's program and for all of you taking time and effort to um, increase your own skills and abilities to help our students. Um, so uh, how many people have heard of Transformation Agenda? Okay. Oh, good lot of people. Okay, great. Um, so the Transformation Agenda is the term that's commonly used to refer to this grant that we have received that originates from the Department of Labor. So uh, it's a federal funds uh, that come to the state of Massachusetts and there's a collaborative effort between um, BCC and the other uh, Massachusetts community colleges. Um, and, um, and the effort is really focused on, um, on what some might call workforce development. However, we know that workforce development largely relies on the success, the academic success of our students. And so they will only be as good in the field, in their jobs, as we prepare them. And, and Mike gave a perfect example about the ability for um, communication competencies. Right? Um, so what do you know about Transformation Agenda particularly? Anyone know anything about the detail of it? heard anything? No? Okay, all right. So I'll tell you a little bit more about it. 
So Transformation Agenda really has as its focus um, this idea of contextualized learning. Okay. Anyone ever heard of contextualized learning? Well, good. Okay. Someone want to try to define what it is? It's okay if it's a little piece of it. Anyone want to take a stab? So these courses that are so English one on one for business students or something. Okay. So sometimes contextualized learning takes place in what we commonly call learning communities, where we couple one course with another course. So we might have a business faculty member and an English 101 faculty member work collaboratively to develop a process where these courses are linked. Right? So that's one model of how contextualized learning works. The idea of it is that we want to teach students within a context. So I don't need to ask you this question, but uh, I would assume that many of you have heard at one point or another a student say something like, what do we have to learn this for? Right? So in my experience, that's a very common kind of sentiment that students have. And so contextualized learning helps take learning which seems abstract and unapplicable, right, even though we know that it's very applicable, they haven't gotten there yet, um, takes that learning and grounds it in a particular context. And so this um, idea of contextualized learning, we know from the research, helps students persist. Because right? instead of feeling like, what do I need to learn this for, they see the connection between how I can use this in real life. So in this project uh, here at BCC, our focus is on uh, a few different areas. It's definitely on adult-basic education, right? GED preparation. It's definitely on English as a second language. And those two parts of the, the work are largely we, we usually refer to those as workforce development efforts. But it also focuses on developmental education because we know that's another place where students are often feeling like, I haven't yet got in my career, right, gotten on my path, or I have no idea what path I want, right? And so we know that providing some context in those courses can be very helpful. The state has hired a private company, they did this last summer, hired a private company to develop some teaching modules. And these modules are focused on particular workforce areas. Okay? And the modules were intended, and I say the word intended, to help us as faculty to be able to integrate them into our coursework so that we can be more contextualized in our approach. Now, the modules were not created by faculty. So you can imagine there's a little translation issue, right? If, you're, if you haven't taught and you're creating some learning modules, you might get a little uh, off, off base, right? So one of the things that we've done is we've taken those modules and tried to reshape and reformat them so that they're gonna be easier for faculty to use. The modules are things like um, uh, healthcare, which is a, a very strong industry in our region. So we know that there are plenty of uh, different kinds of jobs in that area. We, um, another module is information technology, again, a rising industry in our area. Um, we're getting ready to look at one that will relate to solar energy, right? So you might say, okay, so what does solar energy have to do with my developmental English course? And so think about how you might be able to embark on a journey where you are using particular readings, right? That are, that are context-based, that, um, that are related to this, these industries, and might be able to exchange some of those for readings that you might use in your course. Um, typically, uh, another good example is um, for the math faculty that have been using this uh, approach. They have, instead of, you know, Dick and Jane drive 200 miles to Texas and how many hours does it, you know, this kind of word problem stuff that people are like, who cares about Dick and Jane? Um, instead, using problems that are grounded in these industries, real life kinds of problems. Some faculty members have been bringing speakers in to talk about how, um, perhaps how uh, reading and writing is essential in the work that they do in these industries. So there's a number of ways that faculty have been able to infuse these modules into their work. And we've had a pilot that ran in the spring with eight faculty members, 
and a pilot that's running right now with five faculty members. Now, we're, that's good work, but we want to get to the next place. We want to get to the next level. And so what we're hoping is that this might be of interest to you, to take one of your existing courses, work with us to infuse some of this content into your course, um, and tell us how it went. And so I'm going to give you a handout which kind of describes all the details of this. I'll actually split them up so they get out faster. And you'll see on the handout that it gives you a little bit of a framework of what I've just described in terms of what this initiative is. It also gives you um, some benefits to being involved. So you will see on the left uh, bottom quadrant, there are benefits to you and there are benefits to your students. We know from the research that the benefits to our students is that it helps with their persistence. They stop asking the question, what do I need to learn this for, and become a little more invested. Understand how this translates into real life. Um, even if it's an industry that they don't, that they're not interested in pursuing, it's helping them think about their career path. Because we know we have so many students that come in and they really are not clear about what, where they want to go. So um, I, the faculty have, who have been piloting talk about, you know, even if you don't love this, that's okay because you're now eliminating some things from your, from your possibilities. Um, and these are broad industries that people could work in in many ways. So it's not like it's this particular job. Um, you'll see that there are stipend uh, opportunities that are available. There are financial resources that are available for you to get things for your class. There are, um, there's certainly support that's ongoing from the Lash Center for you as you embark on this. Um, and usually what we do is we start before the semester and we'll do this in August have a training where we bring folks together who are going to be in the fall pilot and um, and help you unpack the modules and think about how you might work on that and usually try to cluster the English folks together and the math folks together and the ABE and the ESL folks together. Um, we also hold a monthly reflective practice group which allows people to come together and get some support or share ideas and some folks come in a face-to-face -face way and some folks do it online. So there's another option there. The, um, the program also has, has these um, positions called navigators, which I think is a, so far BCC has underutilized these folks. These are folks that are supposed to help students navigate. And how many of us have seen students that really have no idea how to navigate? They don't have the book. They don't have the, they don't have transportation. They don't have, they have challenges because of their family responsibilities. These navigators are intended to, in some ways, almost case manage and help students get connected with resources. Um, it may be any kind, it could be any kind of connection, either social or academic. Um, and the navigators will actually uh, not only be with the students outside of class at, you know, for a referral, but the navigators will come in and offer their services so that they can make a connection right off the bat with your students if that's something that you're interested in. So I think there's a lot more we could do with these navigators because I think we often see students who are struggling either academically or socially. Um, and then lastly, there are opportunities for statewide conferences. So even though we've just sort of begun working on this since uh, last winter, um, uh, a number of folks have actually gone and participated in the conference and a few people have actually presented their work as well. So um, I have a sign-up sheet, of course, if I want to seize the moment. I will pass it around. Start over here with you, Deb. Um, and this, you know, you're not making a lifelong commitment. I'm asking if you're interested, and we will connect with you and um, and get you connected to training and uh, a stipend and other resources that might be helpful to you. And um, we're hoping to significantly ramp up our numbers for this fall. Um, and we have the, the, um, the knowledge that this grant might continue on for years, which is kind of exciting, but also means that we have to sort of show that we're having some significant impact here. And um, you'll notice also the, that in terms of the expectations, 
um, that we will ask you to participate in an evaluation interview. It will be someone who calls you on the phone and asks about your experience. That's been helpful to us in reshaping our training and reshaping the direction that we're going in. Um, so questions, comments, concerns? Yes, I have one please. question about the modules. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm picturing that when I think of modules, I think of uh, time-limited curriculum. That sort of, you, you look at the curriculum and then all the resources of the grant will help us, um, or we can be independent, whatever. We integrate that module into the curriculum. Is that right, or is our module sort of an overarching thing that should really impact the whole course? So let me let me describe the modules a little bit more, and maybe that will help to answer your question. So the modules are set up so that you have some um, there's some text, there's some literally like a reading uh, at the beginning of each module, which sort of says this is the industry, this is what it's like, this is what people do in this industry. Now, we've been a little challenged because I think the reading level is a little higher than we might have wanted that to be, right? So some folks have used little excerpts from that and unpacked that in class. That's yeah. one way that they've integrated this module. Some folks have tried to use the whole thing, and I think it's, it's worked with varying results. You know your students. When you get them, you'll be able to make an assessment as to whether you want a little or a lot. And that's the other thing. There's no prescription here in terms of how you infuse this you decide how much you want to engage this in your work. Obviously, the more you engage it, the stronger the impact, but you, that's your decision. The next part of the modules are, um, are kind of like a set of resources. So, multiple links to videos, links to other readings, links to um, professional resources that are related to that, uh, that uh, work area. Um, links to data. So that's another thing is if you're, if, if at all, you're trying to help students uh, interpret data in any way. Um, and so these are links that you choose as a menu, how many you want to use, what makes sense according to how your syllabus is constructed. Um, and so that's essentially how the modules look. And so I would view them as sort of a menu of sorts because they will be things that you can pick and choose. Um, and again, I think often what folks have done is use the part of their syllabus that really um, reflects uh, their assessments, uh, their assignments, um, to think about how they can use these things. And again, there's money for speakers, there's money for, you can have this navigator come in. So those things are kind of separate from the, the actual module, but it really is a sort of a bank of resources that you will be able to pick and choose from. Um, and uh, I know, uh, for example, again, some of the math folks, really essentially all that they've done is change the, the problems on their assignments, the math problems, and contextualize them. So it doesn't mean you have to revamp your whole course, because we would never want you to have to do that. Um, but it does mean that there might be, at a, at a glance, you might have some um, some sense of, oh, I think this could be integrated rather easily, or that could be integrated, or that might be an interesting reading, or an interesting video, or an opportunity for an assignment. So does that, does that answer the question, Tom? Um, on, on the CTO blog, the modules are there. Not all of them, because we're just now entertaining the, the energy one. Um, and so you can see them in their, in their pure form, which is um, how they were given to us by the state. Um, and then what we do in the training is really help you unpack those and think about your syllabus. So we'll say, bring your syllabus to the training and let's help you think about, we have some nice worksheets about how to think about uh, which pieces you can use and how they could be integrated. Good question. Again, remember these, the per, in a perfect world, they would have been developed by faculty and been a little more ready to use. But, um, but they still are very good resources. Questions? Can we finish maybe a little transformative agenda commercial? You can, absolutely. So I'm going to leave the sign-in sheets. Jenny, you guys be here a little bit longer? Yeah. All right. So perhaps <laughs> Jen can collect the sheets before she leaves, and that way we'll get in touch with you for some more discussion. <laughs> and I appreciate this. I think that 
One thing I do, I will say, just in closing, is that I think there are tremendous opportunities within this grant. We have not fully realized what we could possibly do. I also think that there are a lot of opportunities for us to shape this going forward because it's not, it's been a little of this and a little of that. So you all who have been working on developmental English um, and that reform could potentially really contribute in a huge way to what this agenda might look like as well. So lots of opportunities to decide what it should look like. Okay, you always see anything. Thank you. Hi, folks. Um, I, I wanted to just say a little bit about the transformative agenda and uh, the transformation agenda. Uh, I always get corrected. Transformative would have been a better name. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big long name. That's right. Yeah. The MCCWTPA. <laughs> uh, I, I want to point out that there, there, there was there's a real logic behind this, and you know, Suzanne pointed out healthcare and clean energy and manufacturing, uh, and, and there's a reason why those programs were selected for this. Uh, the, the fact is that Massachusetts has, uh, you know, has a, has a pretty decent unemployment rate, but we also have tens of thousands of unfilled jobs uh, in some very important industries, and there are industries that students can be, uh, have a, a lifelong career in. Uh, and the fact that the transport agenda and why the Department of Labor put all this money in there is they really want to encourage students to look into those fields and, um, and, and, and have something when they graduate that is not only a benefit to them, but might be a benefit to the Commonwealth and, and the economy. Um, I, unfortunately, I think that the approach was a little heavy-handed in the beginning and didn't really translate from a, a, a bottom-up approach, which is usually tends to be a little more attractive to uh, faculty members and uh, our institution. But the, the goal of it was still, the, you know, very uh, very positive. Uh, so the flip side of that is, you know, I've been now to many graduations. I think eighteen graduations. Um, and, and most of you were all there. And while graduation is this, this wonderful experience, and, and we see you know hundreds of students across the stage, uh, I'm always a little disappointed with the number of students that graduate from here with a general studies degree. And it's not because I'm saying a general studies degree is is uh, you know it, it doesn't have um, you know a value. Because you know they did, they came and they and they met and they went through our. You know they definitely have a, a strong basis with our, uh, you know, with our gen ed courses, and they probably have found things that they really wanted. But at the same time, I see students who come out and, and I'm thinking about them going in for a job interview, and saying and they say, well, what degree was your majors? And you say general studies, and they're like, well, you know, the, I would love to see more students find some niche that really worked for them, and I, and. I'm not, I, I know I probably am getting this reputation as a, as a workforce development guy, because uh, I keep bringing this up at different, um, different events. But I do think for our students, or for the majority of our students, you know, the, the amount of time and money and energy they put into their education has got to result in something really concrete when they graduate. Because, they, because it, it's, a, it's a scarce resource. All those things are scarce for our students. So um, if students, Comes and, and they and their goal is is to become a you know the BC educated person and and they are happy to explore a bunch of different things. I think that's wonderful, but I do think there's a lot of students that graduate with that general studies degree because they haven't figured out what they want, um, and I think that's a missed opportunity. So you know what these uh, modules are designed to do is try to get the students at the very early stages, you know, when they're in developmental math, when they're in developmental English. Say here are some of the industries where you know you could explore, and you know there's jobs in those areas, and we're going to provide assistance. And those navigators, the navigators are for helping those students out. They're also for helping them out eventually to get uh, potentially get a job. You know, um, so I, I think that's one of the reasons why I want to encourage you to really look at these modules because they were selected for a very particular reason. The other thing is I'll, I'll, I'll point out to everyone is. We have a whole pile of transformative agenda uh, resources that you can take advantage of, you know, speakers and, 
and, and different aspects of it. But the other thing about this that you should be aware of is that uh, right here at this institution, uh, nearly every one of the industries that show up in Transformative Agenda has a, an associated program. You know, we have very strong healthcare programs, we have uh, excellent green technology programs, we have a strong advanced manufacturing program. So if you do want to integrate things into your classroom or you have questions about it, we have local expertise for people that can help you out. And even if you want to, um, you know, if you're like, I, I, what, is the, what do they mean by uh, photovoltaic array? What does that really look like? Well, I mean, just so you know, there's one sitting on the roof of this building. And we have expertise that can take you up there, and, and I, we can definitely connect you with faculty members and, and staff members. We'd be happy just to show you something here right on campus. If, if people haven't noticed it, we have a, a, a wind turbine that went up about a month ago. Um, we have a fantastic advanced manufacturing lab at the other end of this building that is filled with about half a million dollars worth of state-of-the-art manufacturing equipment. Uh, if you haven't been to New Bedford to see uh, the Purchase Street building, there is an amazing uh, new series of labs there to support nursing and, uh, and the uh, pharmacy, pharmacy technology and a whole pile of other things, as well as you can get a massage. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so feel free to jump on board. So I mean, this is the kind of things that's going on on campus, and I don't think our students know it's there. Right? I shouldn't say our students. I think a lot of our students do. I think a lot of our students don't. And what this is, this grant is trying to do is make sure they're aware of it. Um, the heavy hand part is the shove them towards a job. And I don't think we necessarily have to do that. I don't, I don't think, I, I'm, I, I'm not encouraging necessarily to push them in one direction or another. What I'm encouraging them to do is make them aware that the opportunity is there. And if that's something they, they want to do, they can explore it um, very easily locally. before I think Jen has to go. I just want to um, quickly say thank you to all the folks that have made this presentation and last week's presentation possible. Jen Deckers Mitchell, who has done an incredible amount of work, um, Susanna Leone, Dean of the CTL, have really supported and made all of this possible. Thank you very much. who has helped so much in helping me understand how to use a great funding source that we had all semester to do a lot of activities that we've done, including uh, what we're doing today and what we did last week. So I really appreciate that. And Mike Pierre, of course, who's been supporting us all along and who is was very integral in getting us this great room and these great computers also through Title Three. So we really appreciate all of that. Um, I think it's time to introduce J.P. Nance. <laughs> uh, Dr. John Palmito, otherwise known as JP, um, is, is a great awesome. teacher, oh, sorry. scholar. <laughs> I think that's the best way to put it. When I think about JP, I think about um, not only someone who's at the top of his game as far as uh, a teacher in the classroom, but also as a scholar. He has. Uh, a number of books, articles, is giving presentations all the time and is always working on a research project. Um, and what excites me most about the work that JP does is it starts in the classroom, he goes to the research, then he takes the research and brings it back to the classroom. And I don't think we can ask for much more um, in our faculty here. I'm very, very excited and enthusiastic to introduce him, JP Dan. Thanks. Thanks, Deb. Is my mic working? All right, well, first, talking about awesome computers, uh, we thought before the session started that we would you take these laptops and put them on your desk, but I thought it'd be better for you to get the experience of what it's like for students to get their own laptops, and the pain in the ass that is. So, um, there are more laptops in here that we need, and what's funny is sometimes students will grab a laptop and try to set it up, and it doesn't work, something's wrong with it, and I say, hey, just get another one. Like, what, I wish that was, what happened at home, I could just, oh, let me just use this one instead. So if you could, we will be using these shortly and not for Facebook. Um, so if you would come up and take one of these laptops, that would be great. Uh, it doesn't really matter which side you take it from or which color cable, but it will need to go back in that same place. So we can do that now and take a minute of rustling. Um, we're going to refer to some PDFs on these laptops that I've emailed you prior to this um, session. There's two cables, so you can't rip them out. Um, 
roughly. The first is the Ethernet cable that Bill is demonstrating. You unclip, and in the back is the charging cable, and that right unplugs nicely. Feel free to get food and drink while we go. They too don't feel like they have to wait. It's my coffee's cold. I'm going. Mm. Try to remember the number you take it out of. The number's not on. It's supposed to be. I guess it doesn't matter. You just put it back in the spot. No, it doesn't really matter. We got you. We're supporting you. Oh, that's a good choice, 19. <laughs> All right, let me let's see. see. You, you squeeze this together, yeah. and you pull it out. It's okay. like a little, and then when you pull it out, there's going to be a cable in the back. It'll just pull out eventually, but you can just take it out with your fingers. Oh, yep. okay. Yep. They're all charged up. Right? Yeah, that charge keeps them charged, yep. And 19 is a good number. Oh, right. it's, a good, it's very satisfying. Yes. Yeah, I know. We're about 15 minutes. Yeah. I want to say, like, a, do a break at 11? Yes. Okay. Yes, so that's fine. We're 15 off. minutes. Just, yeah. yeah right, right. We're not going to use that last 15 for evaluation, yeah. so that's yours. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Cool. Just get five minutes at the end. Awesome. Oh, do you want to say something, Jen, or are you just talking to Deb? Oh, okay. I was dying to say that the, trans, to the transformation agenda, it's more than meets the eye, but oh. I didn't know if everyone would get the, the joke, because that song was playing in my head the whole time. And this joke is being recorded. Okay. There you go. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. That's a good one. What for copyright infringement? All right, once they power on, you're able to log in with your BCC username and password. I really wouldn't suggest doing so just yet because you will be booted off the system well before we are accessing what you need to via the computers in any way. Um, I just wanted you to um, get one of the computers just like students will. So this room, for me, B102, is the birthplace of English 092. This is the very classroom my studio. <laughs> uh, this is the very classroom my students um, sat in as as they took English 090. Really, the, the it was a pilot English 090 section, which is now English 092. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what English 092 is, and then help you think about how might how you might work toward uh, your own English 092 class today. And to do so, I have taken advantage, and Suzanne's already gone, so I can't give her kudos, but this summer I am participating in a CTL professional development course myself to uh, learn more about integrating technology. Bill will appreciate this. He's helped me in the past with technology um, in my own classes. And I'm using a uh, technology today during this session, something called Microsoft PowerPoint, if any of you are uh, familiar. I never use PowerPoint, so it's funny. I know how to use it, and I, I've used it for years, but uh, putting together this sl slideshow brought back some painful memories. I'm hoping it's all going to work. I already found one little glitch this morning as I um, saved it to my USB drive, but... Hmm. First of all, just choosing a theme is difficult. Once you've redone a house, it's like, I'm not sure if the orange, but this is what I went with. Uh, okay. Yeah. And the, this would be a good time for the music. So, that's good. That's good. That's better, better for the video, too. Thanks, Jen. All right. Oh, and I wanted to thank everybody for their flexibility and rescheduling for today. Those of you who could do it, I really appreciated that. I was uh, troubled last week and uh, trying to work through that this week. There's two parts to this presentation, and we're about 15 minutes behind, so um, uh, they, we're ever flexible. We will um, not have a problem, actually, because we're not going to do the last segment was an assessment. So yeah, I'm just going to, people fill out the evaluations, we'll take them. 
we're not going to skip that conversation. Right. So we're just a little uh, 15 minutes behind. So we'll have our first coffee break at 11. Oh my God! Already, I'm talking too much. Um, so let me talk a little bit about what English 092 is first, and whether or not it works. Huh? Clip art. All right. Whatever. Everybody, I guess, knows about the clip art. Uh, so English 092 is supplemental. In order to teach a section of English 092, you must also concurrently be teaching a section of English 101. In your English 101 section still consists of 22 students, or if you're participating in the wonderfully awesome Portfolio Project 19, um, of those 19 students, 10 of those ostensibly could be English 092 students. All right, so it's approximately, it's rough, but it's approximately half of the English 101 students would be English 092 students. So they are taking, and believe me, I had lots of doubts and, and concerns as I began this uh, pilot uh, last fall, spring. I wondered if the students would be able to do the work. Um, how could they do English 090 at the same time as English 101? Don't they need preparation? Um, and the preparation came while they were doing the English 101 assignment. So I'm going to talk about what English 92 is generally now, and then I will talk about what I did with my section of English 92. So as I mentioned, it's supplemental in nature. Uh, for my course, there, was, there were really no new out-of-class assignments for English 092. Their work was the work of English 101, and English 092 helped them to do it. They needed extra support, not only in terms of um, understanding material discussed in class or in the textbook, um, but also in terms of assignments, um, creating original drafts, understanding feedback, right, which is complicated for, I think, many students. Um, but these students need to be, uh, needed to be uh, helped with that part of the process as well. English 092, um, the, in, in English 092, the emphasis on individualized instruction. As a matter of fact, as I thought about this workshop um, more yesterday, after having been away from it for a little while, I, uh, I was struck that I hadn't at all um, put together that um, working in English 092 is based a lot on writing center theory and practice. And I've had, that's really where I come from. Uh, writing set the theory. So when I think about what happened in this room, it was a lot of writing center work. And I've joked with Deb before that I thought people who uh, might be best prepared already to teach English in 92 is anyone who's been in the Quest Writing Lab. And I amend that to say people who I think have worked at the, at the writing center and understand what that means, attending to individual writers' needs. Now, it's not exactly the same situation. In a writing center, you're not the instructor. Right? So you've got to navigate this someone else's assignment and guide students sometimes through um, troubled waters in terms of um, anger sometimes, resentment about feedback or an assignment, or this guy doesn't explain anything in class. Those kinds of things you've got to sort through in a writing center session. Well, here, when that happens, it's awkward because I am the instructor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it still does happen. Uh, <laughs> uh, and there's hands-on work. So I, I don't think, um, I, I never did take this room for granted and the laptops and students didn't either. I was particularly struck early in the semester when uh, we were struggling with how students would save work, right? Because of course you cannot save them on the laptops, they disappear. The reason they're plugged in not, they're not just charging, the USB cord updates them. It erases everything that's saved on the computer um, during that day, the files are saved. It also does you know, antivirus stuff, all this network updates, all that, all that stuff happens at night. That's why they have to get plugged in. I tell students, you can't save it there. Tomorrow it's gonna be gone. So I know seize the day, but there's limits. So in order to save this information, they could email the files to themselves and we talked about that. But USB, a USB drive, a thumb drive, it's really the easiest way. When I asked Deb if 
we could procure some USB drives for students. It took about, it took her, I think, a day and a half. And she said, JP, here, I got the USB. Now, when I passed this out to my students, I was struck by how meaningful that was to them. And the thanks they gave me, several of them, I thought, wow. Because like, I'm thinking they might have been five bucks for these USB drives, yep, that's about right? right? And they're pretty cheap, yep. but I don't even know if they knew what to ask for or what I meant by it. So showing them how that functioned. Being in this room with these labs was so practical and students thought not only did they learn from the hands-on work and doing the writing right here that they could save and it looks kind of pretty when it's word processed, right? Not just handwritten and then they got to do more work of typing all that in, they're getting it done here. Um, but they also appreciated guidance with computers. Guidance which I didn't always provide, which was nice. And we might be able to talk more about that, but um, this small class of 10 students bonds. These people get to know each other. And in these computer labs um, set up in these pods, that's what happened. These people became friends and this is where they always sat. By like this, uh, in this table, I can still remember where people sat every day and they bonded and they became friends and hung out, um, went for cigarettes, wouldn't, not a <laughs> proponent. Uh, I saw them between classes. They, were hang they became um, close. So that, that's kind of a nice aspect too. But they would help each other with computers and they kind of f filled in the bank. Okay, now we can relax. All right, so <laughs> the last thing, uh, well, and that is the last thing I wanted to mention about English 092 in general, the, the learning community approach. Um, the students, I, I remember we were a little bit worried early on that um, students in English 092 might not speak up in the larger English 101 class where there are other students, different students, but, you know, I, I don't know if I can make any generalizations like that. I think the students were students who we know already. Some of them were really strong and participated and were comfortable with that. Um, didn't need to be right all the time, asked questions when they didn't understand. Others never said a word, no matter what I tried. And there was a range, just like in any other English 101 course. Now I'll also say, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to finally get, eventually get to the question of can, can English 92 work? And I hope you think I do believe it can. Um, that it works at different, varying degrees, varying degrees of success that um, you know, it's not like um, we lay on hands, you know, at the English on 92 and it's like, oh my God, this paper is magic. No, some of them suck at first. <laughs> so um, you're going to see a range of abilities, honestly. Um, but students can make it. In fact, few, uh, one um, student only, didn't make it in my last section of English on 92. And I ain't easy. All right. So my, this is the glitch. I don't know why that bullet's showing up. I spent a half an hour on it this morning. <laughs> Please don't read that bullet. Okay, we'll get to the bullet. So what did my section of English 092 look like? First, um, as I mentioned, there were no new out-of-classroom assignments, and that was weird for me um, to have, because in English 090, I had all different assignments, right? completely different from English 101. So not to have any new writing assignments, I'm thinking, is this really... Um, uh, this, this is really coarse. Am I really requiring students to do um, work for a particular grade here? So I'll talk more about that in a second. We have the same textbook. At first I had too, too much to navigate. So at the, it, when I was thinking of the course originally, I said, oh yeah, I'll have this you know, English 090-ish textbook that I've used in the past and my English 101 textbook. No. Uh, what I did was I used the English 101 textbook, but there were Parts of the textbook I accessed in English 092 that didn't really come up in English 101. So more, I don't know, I don't really want to focus only on grammar, but more of the uh, final chapters that dealt with particular grammatical issues, I was able to draw upon in English 092 in class as a resource and also point to it as a resource for out of class reading. Um, also samples. We were able to draw more on the samples in English 092 because we had that class time uh, than I did in English 101. And, th and finally, this bullet, which I think has an animation that's just aggravating me. Um, we did some in-class writing. Now, in English 101, I do a lot of in-class writing. 
Um, for five or ten minutes, I have students write in response to a prompt something that I want to discuss because if I just ask the question, they'll sit there and you know, twiddle their thumbs and not have anything to say. But if I have them sit and think and write and then just tell me what they said, some of them will read what they wrote, others will riff off of that um, and change what they've said a little bit, which is fine. Gets them to talk a little bit more openly. Um, in English Zone 92, um, the writing isn't quite, the in-class writing isn't quite the same as what I do in English 101, but they, I, I asked for more reflection in English 192, and I would definitely do more of it the next time I teach English 192 uh, this fall. I asked them to think about, um, in this in-class writing, what, they've, what they're changing in terms of their writing process. This is a big thing for me. In a writing course, if nothing changes in terms of how they go about writing from the end of the course, um, since the beginning, that makes no sense to me. If you want to get better, you have to change the way you go about it. They talk about Einstein's definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. My diet. Um, so I want them to be thinking throughout the semester about what is changing and what isn't changing and why. Not just at the end, because at the end it is too late. They have to be thinking about it all along the way. Uh, I also like to get, and this is one of my favorite things that I figured out this semester, I get some progress updates. Tell me how your causal analysis is coming, right? Just tell me, explain it to me in in-class writing. Oh my, I can't tell you, those are delicious to read. I love reading the updates, they're so honest, they'll tell you what they're confused about. First of all, I started to do work in the library databases and I was like, what? I'm not finding anything. I asked the reference librarian and, and so I said, oh, all right. Now I can, now the beauty of this class is I can sit with every student in the class during the class meeting and you talk about, hey, I looked at your progress update, I saw you having trouble with this, why don't we get on the databases right now and do it? Put them on a task, roll on to the next person, and I usually could get back to that um, initial intervention, if you will, with that individual. So I, like, I really like progress updates. And we also use class time to do some pre-writing. And I encourage students, despite what we still hear, and I think, I don't know if administrators would be surprised at this, but students say, oh, I need to write that out. I need to write it out longhand on a piece of paper. And I say, right, well, I'm comfortable writing it out. And I say, well, I'm here to make you uncomfortable, because that's learning. So I'm going to suggest you use, you use Microsoft Word. Now, if they really push back and say, OK, well, you can use paper. You're going to have to type that in again anyway. And then if you make changes, it's a little bit more difficult than typing it. Uh, I try to get them to be a little bit more efficient in terms of turning their pre-writing into something that is more organized, some kind of logic outline, and then to go right in that same document and that same logic outline and create the paper from it. Not to think of those as separate entities, but to be flowing from one to the next. And we try to work on that process in class. This slide's so packed, sorry. See, did you see that? It's <laughs> a little heartbeat there. I don't know why I did that. Uh, Bill Gates. Uh, individualized instruction. Now, um, I, uh, I honestly, I really didn't know what was gonna happen. Like I know, I, I really feel confident as a tutor, and I'm hitting my microphone, and feel like um, I, I can be faced with many different situations and deal with them. If you're not as comfortable, that comfort comes with practice and time. And it is, I think, crucial um, as a writing instructor that we develop that comfort level. When you sit with a student and, and work with them in terms of their writing, you have to deal with sticky situations, right? As you're writing up the assignment, you're thinking, oh, I really should explain this a little bit more because they're gonna have trouble. You get the trouble, right? <laughs> and then you gotta figure it out with them, right? And I've had students point out things to me that were Fabulous. And I said, you know what? I'm redoing the assignment. I'm, I'm, I'll get you the, the new version. That's a great point. We have, we have, I have to make sure that that's not a requirement because I, I can't, um, we can't do it that way. So there are certain tasks, certain uh, things that happen in class. And I thought I'd list a few of them here. One is checking in. So this um, is, it could be in terms of understanding what happened um, in yesterday's class. Or, so, um, you know, we, we had to read chapter eight about short articles today. How'd that go? Did you read the chapter? Yeah, did you read the samples at the end? 
Oh, no, I never read the samples. Oh, you got to read the samples. Let's look at one right now. See in this one, right? And we do a little bit of that right there. I mean, even if only for a couple of minutes, checking in with each individual student, how you doing? Now, to us, we like to know, to them, that translates in ways I can't even explain. Never before have I had a semester, I, I, I don't fake caring about students. I honestly care about my students. Um, but never before have I had my students realize that more than this semester, right? And I can't tell you, it, that was su such a rewarding aspect of this, the pilot, um, to feel it back, like, because you do all that work sometimes, you're like, yeah, whatever, yeah, good luck! You know, as they leave, they're like, yeah, whatever, buddy. But they were so thankful. I had, I had a student in my office um, who actually said, quote, thank you so much for this course. Right? She's teary-eyed and she told me that. I said, wow, well, I mean, that's got to mean something. So they really saw the value in it. I uh, checked in with them regularly. They got head starts, which felt a little bit like cheating at times, but that's kind of a crazy way to think about it. So if we were going to, and I'll show you some of these attempts on my part soon, uh, we did an application essay. So they had to um, look up an application for transfer to an institution that they thought they might uh, transfer to eventually, or a scholarship. And I'll let you know, two of the students who did the scholarship application were awarded scholarships during the class, right? I mean, that's just, anyway. Uh, I, so I had them do this assignment. So before, you know, I'm thinking, because I've done this assignment before, I'm thinking, where do students have trouble? Where do they slip up? Let me try to prevent that. So I created additional supplemental materials to try to prevent it. Okay, let me take a step. Because always my assignments are kind of stepped. I tell them a process. Here's what I think you should do. But these steps are a little finer, and I'm intervening. Especially earlier in the semester, I intervened a lot. I wanted to see everything. Later on, I was like, all right, well, you got that. You're having trouble. You let me know. I'll come over to help them get more of a sense of independence, because they weren't going to be in this class forever, to be able to do these things on their own once they, they get a sense of the steps. So. Uh, with the application essay, I created my first supplemental materials, and I'm going to share that um, with you soon as a handout. You th I think I call it a quick start, a, uh, quick start guide or something like that, um, which had a, a list of steps that they did in class during that session. I checked in with them along the process. So I gave them head starts. I also might have let them know about something that we were going to be doing in class and to prepare for that, right? to start thinking of ideas, because I'm going to ask you in class, what stories can you tell relative to college? What are some options? We'll talk a little bit about it during this, this class. A lot of guiding drafts in progress. They're writing here, right? I'll say, well, this whole class meeting, we're going to be working on our application essay draft, right? You've got your notes loaded up in a separate file. We're going to be drafting. I'm going to come in. I'll give you a, a few minutes to load up. And then I'm going to start going around. I'll check in with you. Um, I had the benefit of a tutor, a, a peer tutor for them, who helped me do that because initially the first four weeks, I, I don't know how many students I had, but it felt like a hundred. Uh, the first few weeks I was doing it by myself and I was just kind of like Kelly, um, the, the writing lab, how I sometimes felt there where it was just so much going on, so many students, and I couldn't bop, bop, bop around to everybody. Actually, it isn't the quest writing lab because you have the instructor as well to help you with that. So I kind of, I kind of felt like, oh my God, I got to get to everybody, but I couldn't spend as much time as I wanted with everyone. So a peer tutor definitely was helpful. Um, but there was a lot of guiding drafts in progress. Uh, Follow-ups. Now by follow-up, I mean when something happened in class that I thought um, might have been a little confusing, I'll follow up here. And I also would follow up in terms of my own feedback. I don't, no, I didn't share in any form with you um, in handouts today or anything I emailed, which I'll ask you to get in, into in a little while, um, this morning, how I respond to student drafts. But I respond, I, I don't write on the draft. I write them a letter in response to the paper. And the letter is sometimes longer than the paper, but it's usually about uh, one page, single spaced. And they're all unique. I don't take, you know, I don't go, you know, press a macro F7 and here's paragraph one. It's like I sit and type it, which actually has made me a pretty good writer. <laughs> I like doing those letters, but because I'm sensitive 
to what it's like to get feedback. And for some of these students, right, as soon as you start um, giving them feedback, it's criticism and they start resenting it. So there's a lot of good woven into those letters that I write. But as much as I try to attend to audience, there are some things that are still not understood um, and they don't know how to proceed. And I try to make it concrete, but I say, well, you know, you got the feedback, you're working on your revision, so what are you trying to do? Um, if anyone does post writes, which is, um, if you're not familiar, once a student has done a draft and gotten feedback, um, some instructors require that the revision includes a document which explains what the feedback was and what was changed in the draft. Um, and I, I've had instructors in the past, actually my own instructors called them post writes, so that's what I call it now, and I use these um, meta texts, right? Um, in this, when you read the summary of what students thought your feedback meant, sometimes it's like, oh my, what in the, the translation? So I've really, I'm really pretty in tune with the translation now. If you say this section is confusing, it means to students, cut this section. Not try to make it clear, right? Even though you're thinking, wow, really love that story, but I wasn't really clear how it, right? I'll just cut it. That's what the translation is like, no, no. You're not just going to cut it. You don't give up on that, right? You've got to tie it in. So we did a lot of that um, follow-up on feedback. And uh, that was challenging at times because the feedback was associated with a grade. So sometimes that got a little confrontational when it was face-to-face. -face, Finally, and I've already mentioned this, but in, uh, the last thing that I think happened during class was developing a comfort level. Now, I'm pretty informal, if you haven't gathered. Um, and I'm, I think, I don't know if it's a flaw. I've told my wife this, but I feel like I'm always the same. Like, my kids think there's work dad and home dad. I'm like, no, no, this is pretty much <laughs> what I'm like at work. Uh, you joke around? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep, I do, I do. I mean, I'm always that same way. but. Um, when students see the, the bald guy at the front of class in English 101, if they don't have the opportunity to sit one-on-one -on -one with me every other day and have me talk with them about their issues and what they're understanding and not understanding, it takes a long time to develop the comfort. In English 92, it was like, I don't know, an injection of time together, right? So we were spending so much time together, they were so much more comfortable, they were so much more likely to ask me questions here and outside of class, visit office hours. So um, I definitely witnessed that enhanced comfort level. Can I interrupt you? Yeah, absolutely. I just, Am I, yeah. Probably would have said this during the time I told you I'm not taking, so I'll take oh, it. Oh, 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 all right. Um, I just wanted to say that I did focus groups um, in JP's class, but definitely in his class, a focus group and some written evaluation. And I can say 100% that what he's saying about the affective piece of the students in this class was 100% true for what they told me when he wasn't in the room, which was, I can tell this instructor really cares about whether or not we learn. And frankly, my, my favorite quote out of the focus group for this class was, okay, I'm saying which of these portfolios, all right, maybe I am and I'm, I'm just not hearing it. Which of these portfolios is the work of the 092 students and which isn't? Yes. So you think the second one isn't? because it's too underdeveloped, and during class we would have worked on the development. Oh, I see what you're saying, okay. All right. Everybody think it's number two? It's not 092? Number one. So that student just placed into English 101 and didn't need English 192, the first portfolio, the nerds one. No, no, I thought number one was. You thought number one was in both, 092 and 101? All right. This question is a lot more complicated than I thought. I'm actually getting into it now. I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, cameraman. What's better, 192 or 101? It's not that one's better than the other. Well, uh, I'm sorry, what's, which one's more advanced? Uh, that's a good question. When a student gets into 101, they don't need any developmental coursework. So what I wondered when I started was, if is a student who who, when they take the placement exam, places into English or 90, 
can they do English 101 work? Because when they do the placement exam, we're saying, well, you're not ready, right? So now it's not like we have any preparation time. Like we're not stretching before the workout, right? We're not getting ready for the game. We're just playing, right? So during the game, you know, you get hit and you're on the ground. And you're like, all right, that was a good hit. I really, yeah, that hurts. All right, well, next time, you know, and they're like, all right, all right, like Bergeron. All right, well, I'll still play, even though my lung's punctured. But uh, so we, I thought it would be really difficult for, for some students. So now I'm saying, you know, when I look at these English 101 portfolios, can you tell which students placed in to English 090 and which placed into English 101? That, that's maybe the better, right. clearer question. Thank you. Yeah. I don't think the last one uh, placed into 90. Okay. I agree with Tom, but you never know. You might be surprised. I think but the first one did. The first portfolio one placed into English 90? Because I think the second one is more obviously underdeveloped. Oh, so oh, I see. I, I think we're trying oh, to you're comparing. Your you're comparing. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're comparing. But also, I, I think it's the first one, too, because she seems really, I, she seems really connected to the subject matter and to the, you know, kind of the choices that she's made in a way that sort of, it sort of implies that maybe someone's encouraged her to think about those. She's really excited about kind of the progress that she's made. It's, uh, one at least seems to have more evidence to me of, of other things going on besides just the assignment and just a general in class. That's interesting. Right, mm -hmm. you see the developmental expression. Mm. Well, I mean, she she seems like she's got a connection with the work that she's doing. Yeah. Like she's like if you read yeah. her letter, I mean, she's very excited about the difference between most of the English classes she's been in and the one she's in now. And I don't. I mean, I, it's not. That, it's not. I tried to take all that stuff out. <laughs> I, I was cutting things. I'm like, all right, let me paste this together. Well, well, No, it's pretty bad. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. I just, I just no, I hear, I hear. The connection with the work itself too, like it just seems like there's more going on than just the class. I didn't anticipate that angle. You're, you guys are astute. Well, these are all English 92 students at, oh. in English 101. Even the last one, Tom. Wow. Um, yep. Um, that's that student, um, and and the the first student, the first portfolio was one of the strongest, if not the, one of the top two strongest English 101 students in the class, the highest grade in the class. Um, the fisherman did very, very well. Um, it had a trepidatious beginning. He, I don't know, I don't want to be too personal, he has his videotape, but he became very close with another classmate from a very different culture early on in the semester. I don't know, I just, I, it's so corny and you can judge me, but I just love my students. And I don't always love my students, but in English 192, and I had such a range, but I appreciated them all. And they all challenged me in different ways, but man, did I have some great students. Because I, I was so nervous the first couple of weeks, Deb will tell you. They had to talk me off the ledge. We have these weeding, meetings every week. and Because I, I just, I'm very ethical and I don't want to let students think they're going to make it when I don't know if they're going to, but when I saw that memoir, I thought, damn. And believe me when I say, you might say, well, that's not all his. No, that was his work. I saw him type the damn thing, right? I'm, I'm witnessing it here. Like, wow. So I'm telling them, like, they don't have any confidence, right? They fully expected to be in English 090. Um, when they were here, they, they didn't think anything of it. What they were worried of is about was whether or not they were gonna be able to make it in English 101. So developing confidence, is, and for that first student too, you can see, I think she has it now, <laughs> Kelly. Um, I think that was a big thing for them too. All right. Well, I'm glad we got to talk about these portfolios. I didn't know if we'd have time to do it, but let me see if I can get back to my big show. Good. Uh, curses. All right. And we're back. Yes. <laughs> Coffee break and fruit and then we'll um, start again at 11:15, right for part two where you'll talk much more